And we're back. In this video series, I'm going to be talking about abnormal uterine bleeding. So we've got different types. We have heavy menstrual bleeding, intermenstrual bleeding, postcoital bleeding, postmenopausal bleeding, and amenorrhea. And in this video, we shall be discussing heavy menstrual bleeding, HMB for short. However, before we know what is abnormal, we need to understand what normal menstrual bleeding is and how the menstrual cycle works. So in my previous video, which I'm going to link here, you can have a look at the details of the menstrual cycle. So just as a recap from that video, here are the normal characteristics of a menstrual cycle. So a menstrual cycle should last around 24 to 38 days. The regularity, so the variation between the cycles, should be less than 9 days. Menses should last around 4 to 7 days. And the volume of blood lost should be less than 80 mils. Another thing we need to mention before we delve into the different types is that it is important to keep in mind that these can coexist. So for example, a patient might have heavy menstrual bleeding and intermenstrual bleeding at the same time. Great. So let's look at heavy menstrual bleeding. So basically, this refers to excessive menstrual blood loss, which is interfering with the physical, social, emotional, or material quality of life of the woman. Classically, it was defined as blood loss of more than 80 mils per cycle. But of course, we know that this is very difficult to quantify. So in reality, HMB is very subjective. So in clinic, there are particular questions we need to ask to quantify this heavy menstrual bleeding. We ask how long menstruation lasts, how many times you change pads every day or tampons, does the patient see any clots? We ask about different forms of abnormal uterine bleeding, so we ask about intermenstrual bleeding and postcoital bleeding also taking place during the cycle. Okay, now for a statistic here, so HME is very common and affects around 14 to 25% of women, and in fact is a very common complaint to the gynae outpatient clinic. Now, moving on to the causes of abnormal uterine bleeding. So first of all, whenever a patient presents with abnormal uterine bleeding, the first thing we must do is rule out pregnancy and therefore take a pregnancy test. Now, FIGO has classified causes for abnormal uterine bleeding as a collective, so for all the different types of abnormal uterine bleeding. And they use this acronym, PALM-COEN. So here we've got polyps, adenomyosis, leomyoma, malignancy and hyperplasia, coagulopathy, ovulatory dysfunction, endometrial causes, iatrogenic causes, and causes which have not yet been classified. Now, the palm causes are essentially the structural causes which we've already discussed in the uterine pathology videos, and I'll leave a link to these in the description. So we're going to be discussing the Cohen causes here. Starting off with coagulopathy. So of course, someone with a bleeding disorder might present with heavy menstrual bleeding. The most common one is von Willebrand disease. So to help us identify if the HMB is coming from a coagulopathy, we must ask a set of screening questions when thinking the history. So we need to ask if she has been suffering from HMB since menarche, or if she ever suffered from any of the following, postpartum hemorrhage, surgery-related bleeding, or bleeding associated with dental work. And of course, if a bleeding disorder is suspected, we must get advice from the hematologists. Next, we've got ovulatory disorders. So when we have no ovulation, that is anovulation, you have excess unopposed estrogen on the endometrium, which results in abnormal uterine bleeding, usually presenting with irregular cycles. Several conditions may result in anovulation, and this is because of the effect on the hypothalamopituitary ovarian uterine axis. Okay, so a quick note over here on this HPO axis. So essentially, we've got the hypothalamus, which secretes GnRH. This stimulates the anterior pituitary gland to secrete FSH and LH. And these in turn stimulate the ovaries to secrete estrogen and progesterone. Now the estrogen and progesterone secreted will have a negative feedback effect on both the anterior pituitary, inhibiting the release of FSH and LH, 
as well as the hypothalamus inhibiting the release of GnRH. Now, when we talk about anovulation, we are essentially saying that there is a problem in the HPO axis, not allowing for ovulation to occur, and hence excess estrogen to be produced. Such conditions include hypothyroidism, hyperprolactinemia, extremes of weight, mental stress, and excessive exercise. Okay, great. So next, we're going to look at endometrial causes. So here we are referring to a structurally normal uterus with regular menstrual cycles and no bleeding disorder. This is likely to be an endometrial disorder. Before, this was referred to as dysfunctional uterine bleeding. We haven't fully understood what is going on here, and it is most likely to be a combination of a number of causes. Basically, we should never assume that the HMB is secondary to dysfunctional uterine bleeding, and it should be used only as a diagnosis of exclusion. Good, so next we've got iatrogenic causes. So essentially, uh, we are looking at things which we are doing as medical professionals that might be resulting in heavy menstrual bleeding. So here we've got sex steroids, such as the live on our intrauterine system, the Mirena, or long-acting progesterone preparations like the implant. These affect the hormonal environment and can result in irregular bleeding. Next, we've got those drugs that alter the activity of liver enzymes, so affecting the circulating levels of sex steroids, such as anti-epileptic drugs and anti-TB drugs. We've also got anticoagulants, such as warfarin and heparin, which can of course increase the risk of HMB, and tricyclic antidepressants, which may result in hyperprolactinemia, which as described previously can result in anovulation and therefore HMB. Okay, so lastly, we've got the causes which are listed under the not yet classified section by FIGO. And these are rare conditions, such as isthmuscles, which are basically defects in the cesarean section scar, uterine arteriovenous malformations, and myometrial hypertrophy. Okay, so now how do we work up these patients? So of course, we take SCBC, because if the patient has been losing a lot of blood for a long time, then she might be anemic. We want to check her TFTs, because as we said, hypothyroidism can result in HMB. A clotting screen to check for problems with coagulation. And essentially, we also need to do a transvaginal ultrasound scan to identify any structural pathologies. Then, we can also consider obtaining an endometrial biopsy, in the outpatient setting as a pipel biopsy or as in theater by performing a hysteroscopy DNC. So of course, the management now relates to treating the particular pathology identified. And here we're going to look at a general overview of the different options available. So the management options can be divided into medical and surgical. And in the medical options, we've got the normal hormonal ones, where we have the antifibrinolytics, such as tranexamic acid, which is given as one gram three times a day. This will help to reduce the bleeding. Patients must be informed to start this as soon as the bleeding has started. It is very important here to ask for a history of thrombosis of DVT and PE, as it is contraindicated in these patients. NSAIDs are also another option, such as mefenamic acid, which is given as 500 milligrams three times a day. Again, this will help reduce the bleeding and can also help with any dysmenorrhea. Okay, so then we've got the hormonal options. Firstly, the combined oral contraceptive pill, as this will result in a lighter menstruation. Another option is the levonorgestrel intrauterine system, the Mirena. This is ideal in women who have completed their family as it has a better side effect profile when compared to the OCP. Then we've got the surgical options, which are of course related to the type of surgical pathology identified. So we can opt for a myomectomy, a transcervical resection of the fibroid, hysterectomy, and uterine artery embolization. Again, we explained all of these in more detail in the uterine pathology videos. Great, so you'll find all the other videos I mentioned linked below. I hope that this was useful. Next up, we'll have IMB, PCB and PMB. Thank you.